I'm here with Senator Mario Scavello, a Republican from Monroe and Northampton counties. Senator, can you tell me a little bit how the Senate is dealing with this COVID-19 outbreak? Well, I have to give a lot of credit to the leadership up in Harrisburg, because especially when uh, you know, you're in the middle of a, a pandemic, that we're able to move legislation for the first time electronically by by a video conferencing. And uh, the only thing that we've been moving, however, were bills to help people cope with, uh, with the coronavirus situation that we're, we're under. So um, in the last few uh, weeks, the last couple of weeks, we passed bills that normally we'd have to be there for. And, with, and we don't, people don't, you know, with the, with the uh, Capitol building closed basically to everyone else. Uh, this was probably the, the best scenario. And uh, we're able to make comments in a committee meeting. Uh, we're able to make comments on the floor. It, it's just absolutely, it's just been amazing with technology today. Uh, and it's only going to be used for this, for this emergency. It's not going to be any other. If there's a bill that had to be moved in the past, you had to wait uh, to get there. But this is so much quicker when we were able to do many, many good things. Um, that would no normally have taken much longer time to do. Can you describe some of that legislation that has been sure. passed in the Senate? Sure. You know, the, just just uh, the the uh, schools giving them direction on on the amount of days. Uh, that was one bill. Uh, putting 50 million, 50, 40, 50 million into a grant program because uh, we used dollars already also there. We matched them together into a grant program for small business up to $100. Um, and those type of things. And so helping, uh, um, there's a bill right now that we moved that's over in this in the House, and the House hopefully will take it up fairly quickly. Uh, electronic notary, because in many cases, um, they're just, um, you know, it, it's very difficult for them to go in front of somebody to meet them. So electronically notary, we, ha we have also put out there um, uh, information dollars for 50 million in dollars to help uh first responders and to buy medical equipment that was moved that's it's hanging over there in the senate to move um the the um right now on property tax there's a two percent discount if you pay within a certain time and the senate's passed and now the house has to take it to extend that period to, to the end of may versus the end of april so it'll save some taxpayers some money, those type of things. So it, it's, all, it's all good things that, that'll help people in this time. Now, why have those bills been so important for the Senate to take up and to pass, especially because, at a time like this? Because people are struggling out there. And if we don't help them uh, quickly, you know, uh, you know this, unemployment hasn't really started yet, or if it has just begun, but with the people that are struggling out there, every every moment counts and so we're also unfortunately there are some times that we don't agree with the governor we feel that the construction jobs on our roads should be going on right now there's no reason for it you know you're in your own piece of equipment you might have six people in a 10 mile stretch you know what i'm saying so there's no reason why we can't get some of those construction workers working rather than giving them unemployment and not only that but it's much safer now because there's less traffic on our roads. So what legislation have you put forth specifically? There is Senate? a bill in the House that we're waiting to do, but we decided to write the governor a letter and we all signed on to re look at that as an option. And then no matter who I speak to on both sides of the aisle, they feel that that is something that the governor should be doing because when it all, ha when everybody comes back, just think of this, the projects that weren't done are going to be continued. And so we'll be behind the eight ball the rest of the year. It, the longer we don't put people out there to fix these road projects, uh, we might not get all the road project projects done this year. We'll be delaying it into another year. So it's important that we that we you know stop stop the clock on the on these projects. Now you're also the chair of the Banking and Insurance Committee in the yes, Senate. Can you talk a little bit about maybe things that your committee has been doing to help people during this time of COVID-19? Well, we actually, uh, banking is one to help, uh, you know, not every bank is accepting the SBA uh, information. A lot of people would complain about Wells Fargo 
that they weren't. And the unfortunate part is Wells Fargo was capped because of uh, the case that they had against them about a year ago. So they can't accept more, otherwise they probably would. Uh, but getting banks to, um, to take on the program, and many of them say, well, look, if, the, if they're a customer of mine, uh, we will we will do it. PNC, God bless them. They came out right out and said we'll do it. We'll we'll do everybody. And so th- those are the you know. Uh, but that's important because you know if you don't have the federal dollars, we have the federal you know SBA. The whole pro- program is there, but we need banks to jump to the table and uh, and make it happen. Now you've also called for the suspension of short term rentals here in Pennsylvania. Can you talk yes. about why that was so important for you? Specifically? Yeah. You know, we're ground zero here in Monroe, Northampton County. If you look at, especially Monroe, you look at the, at the population and uh, per, you know, per capita, we're one of the highest. And what's deceiving in our numbers, even at ground zero, is the fact that all of the New York and New Jersey cases that are in our hospitals now that are counted here in Monroe, don't go on the counts that you're looking at. They, they're counted in New York and they counted in New Jersey. So if you, the the Monroe numbers, they had 60% more. That's how much the impact has been. We've had a tremendous amount of these these, uh, short-term people, uh, Reynolds, they've advertised in New York, okay? Coronavirus free, come up to the Poconos. So they'll rent these three bedroom homes and outside those three bedroom homes are six cars. So they got like 20, 25 people squashed into a home, okay? And you know, after a while you have an argument, so some they start going on to the community, which they're not supposed to. They're supposed to go ha- you know, stay in within that for 14 days. You can't go, you can't go anywhere. That's that's and that was so what we tried to do is look, we asked them first. And some were they pulled on the edge and some did not advertise. But the majority of them still continue to. So the, we, we went after, we asked the governor, the state representative in our area, Representative Brown, Madden. So it's both parties, myself, uh, Representative Rader, which, and Representative Pfeiffer up in Pike County, uh, Representative Hahn in, Monroe, in uh, Northampton, Representative Emmerich in Northampton. We, we all got together and, we, and we, we, we pretty much asked the governor, you got to do this. This is important to us. And the other thing is, um, to get the governor to, on the PennDOT message boards coming into the state, to talk about the 14-day quarantine if you're coming into Pennsylvania. Because if, even if we get our residents to do that here in Monroe and Northampton, Pennsylvania, and if they come out and they don't do that, we got a problem. And I'll have to tell you, it wasn't happening. You know, you can see it in our communities because all the short-term places, they're all jammed right now. And unfortunately, the short-term rentals, and the, um, the, they're jammed with, with a tremendous amount of cars on the outside. We're worried. So with the governor's order, and yesterday, um, Secretary Dennis Davin, the, the Community Economic Development, wrote a letter to all the Airbnbs and all those uh, re- rentals to let them know that it is against the law to continue to rent. Get out to your members and let them know. And, and the, the state police is also going to monitor their websites and if they're still inviting people to come up for this month, I'm sure the state police is going to give them a call and say, cut it out, otherwise you're going to get fined. So we, we're, we're trying to protect. If, I, I told these, I told these um, Airbnbs and all these rental places, if we do not stop this virus from growing in this county this month, there won't be a summer business because it's just going to take off into May, into June. So make the sacrifice now for a few weeks. And normally it is a slow time for them, okay? Make the sacrifice now. And the reward is going to be you'll have a summer. Now we've been talking about rentals in your area of the state. Can you describe the situation with COVID-19 in Monroe and Northampton counties and, and how your office is working to help your constituents? Anytime somebody has a, a first of all, if, if I can tell you, let me tell you a personal story. My wife. Uh, she's making masks and delivering them to the two hospitals. She just went for a second delivery to, to uh, St. Luke's. She's making masks for my staff. She's making masks for a company that has a lot of truck drivers. So, and, and we're trying, and I'm promoting that for people that can do that. If they need the, if they need the cloth, if they, I'll help them get the, uh, what they need to be able to, uh, 
make masks because we can give them even to the to the, uh, the elderly who are the most important when they go shopping they can have them you know so we're willing we will one one thing about Monroe Northampton County the residents here when when things are down they really help uh, their neighbors and uh, and to me that that's it's 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 a good thing to see and I think it starts at the top because the, the representatives that we have here in this area are that way. They reach out and help people. And one final question before before we go. How is your office specifically dealing with this COVID-19 outbreak? The phone's are literally off the, off the hook, but I'm blessed because uh, two years ago when we, we moved our office, um, and we, we would not have been able to do this if we stayed at the other office because the desks were like literally four feet apart. We have plenty of space. We have four separate offices, and then there's two desks that uh, three desks actually that uh, are separated by more than 12 feet apart. We're not allowing people in unless you know um, you know uh, it, it's something that we need to help them on a computer or something. Take them to a special room, make sure that they're protected. There's enough distance, but otherwise. Uh, uh, if we, if we weren't here, I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out there would be hurting because they wouldn't have no recourse. If they have a problem with um, unemployment that they can't get in, I have a young, I have a man, that, an employee that works for me that used to, uh, that he's retired, but knows that unemployment system like uh, no one else. And he's, you know, and we, we seem to get results. Um, and so uh, for us anyway, uh, I think it's important that we are here. I know Senator Boscola's office is open. And she has staff there as well. And the two, between North, Northampton and Monroe, we're well covered. Well, Senator Scavello, thank you so much for talking with us. No, my pleasure. You have a great day. PCN offers Pennsylvania organizations, business, and associations the opportunity to have their message telecast statewide. Fusion on PCN is a platform for you to reach out to all of Pennsylvania using our statewide cable network and online streaming. You produce the content with your message and PCN delivers it statewide. Fusion is a partnership that helps expand your reach and meet objectives through an alliance with PCN. Go to PCNTV.com slash Fusion for more information. We're joined by Paige Cognetti, the mayor of Scranton. Thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Now, can you describe the situation with COVID-19 in Scranton right now? Sure. We feel we feel okay here. We have been really hunkered down as a city for, gosh, is it three weeks now? It feels like a longer than that. But um, in Scranton, we, we started early. We really have been communicating with our hospitals, with our emergency uh, teams, with our first responders, with our community. We're a tight-knit community here, which I think has helped us um, really the messaging of, that we started out with, you know, at the beginning of this crisis where we all realized that we could be silent carriers. Scranton's the kind of place where you might still live with or near your, your parent or your grandmother. That tight-knit, that family closeness that we have in Scranton really helped people understand from the beginning, I think, what it meant um, to save others, save lives um, by staying home. So that's really resonated well here. And while we've, you know, we still have our challenges and I've, I've had to make some recommendations in the last couple of days ahead of Easter weekend. Um, and we've had to do some things that we didn't want to do, like take the basketball hoops down. Um, by and large, people are staying home and we're really encouraged by that. We're also encouraged that, um, that we are hopefully successfully flattening the curve. We haven't seen in Lackawanna County, we haven't seen quite the uptick in cases um, or fatalities uh, that we, we may have had we not been distancing for these last few weeks. So we're cautiously optimistic, um, but we've got to stay the course. How many cases are you seeing in Scranton? So I don't have the breakdown by city. I have the county data. Mm -hmm. um, so we ticked up, we did tick up over 200 today. Um, the, the deaths did uh, go into double digits. We're at 10 deaths now. So we're, you know, we're there. Those cases are climbing. The deaths are, like I said, they're climbing, thankfully, slower than I think we, we could have seen. But we're in no way out of the woods yet. And these next couple of weeks are critical. So we're really maintaining that, that line that, you know, stay home, save lives, continue to, I continue to have my town halls twice a week. And the paper is doing a great job of covering this. The local news stations are doing a great job. It's, it's, it's all hands on deck. And I think so far we've, we've been doing everything we can. Now, what are your biggest concerns in Scranton during this really difficult time? 
I, I get worried about cabin fever. I'm worried. We saw, you know, the beautiful weather out last weekend and I did kind of go around and take a drive to all the corners of the city and realize that for the most part, people are staying home, but there are some folks playing basketball and volleyball and we had to then take the nets down and take the hoops down. Um, it, there was some folks that I, I get it. It's really tough. We've been at home for three weeks. Some people even more not used to be to being at home cooped up. I, I worry that as the, the weather breaks that we back. So I've been really aggressive this week, made some recommendations around retail locations, only five people per thousand square feet, um, made a recommendation around faith-based uh, community, faith-based and community organizations to please, you know, please, please don't have services, even though um, this is a, an important week in many faiths, that we just can't be doing that right now. Even drive-ins, just please, please, please don't do that. You know, we have to make these sacrifices now. So it's that backsliding and cabin fever that worries me. Um, and of course, you know, on the other side of the things, if we had more testing, that would be great. But, you know, that's, we're all in the same boat all over the country in terms of the testing. Now, with your recommendations, what do you see the effect being in the future of people listening to those recommendations and taking them to heart? So the recommendations, for example, on the retail locations, that's, it's tough. Uh, it's tough on businesses, I know, to add a, another layer of, it's not a, it's a recommendation, not an order, but it's another a layer of, of temporary regulation. We're really trying to do this. And I talked with many of our business owners to help them. That way their customers feel confident walking into to the store that they'll be able to social distance. That way their employees know that there's, again, there's more space there for them to, to not feel like they're in danger either. So it's really it's really to help them. The business owners here um, have been doing a great job and, and they get it. They really, really get it. And I, it's, it's hard. And I think in the long term, you know, there, it's going to be a new normal, not back to normal. There's a, a new normal that I'll, that I'll have to be in place and the economy will have to open up you know, step by step, that will be that will be difficult. And we're trying to, to work that work that here as best we can and help those business owners. Now, there are several hospitals in Scranton, are they prepared for Coronavirus? And how are you working with them to make sure that they have the support that they need? So we've been in touch um, on a near daily basis with both um, the Commonwealth Health System here and with Geisinger. We're very, very fortunate that both of those hospital systems are right here in the heart of Scranton. And they, they feel confident in their ability to withstand um, a, a reasonable uptick in cases. They have their surge plans in place uh, should they need them. They are so far cautiously optimistic like I am that, that we've helped flatten the curve already, but they, they have those, those contingency plans in place. PPE remains a challenge. Uh, it really, really is a challenge throughout the whole, as we said, the whole country, the state. Uh, we're still trying to procure supplies for them. Um, and they're, you know, they have their channels. We have our channels. We're trying to help on ours, them, them through there and see what we can get. We've been successful in getting, in getting some things for them additionally, which has been um, really helpful. And then now I'm concerned about the nursing homes. We're also trying to, uh, to make sure the nursing homes have what they have, as we've seen uh, some cases in our nursing homes here and, and hoping that we can stop the spread within those nursing homes. That's a real concern right now. Now, you've also called for the suspension of Greyhound Bus Lines passenger service into Scranton. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why you called for that and the importance of stopping that bus service as of right now? So a couple weeks ago, uh, we, some of our local uh, carriers, there's a, March Trailways is a local business, a family business up here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. They proactively stopped their service and I was in touch with them. I, I started to, to talk with Greyhound at that point. Greyhound, you know, is, is coming from New York City. They they were bringing in some supplies. Red Cross works with Greyhound to bring in some supplies. They kept me um, privy to their different protocols at Port Authority uh, for screening passengers, giving passengers PPE. They also kept me updated on their numbers. By last week, their numbers on a daily basis, there was one bus coming in from New York. It was about an average of five passengers a day. So we kept in touch about that. And, um, you know, obviously as a mayor, I can't, I can't, um, be, I can't close the border. Um, I, that's, you know, I didn't want to call for something that, that I wasn't able to call for on my own, but it did get to a point that, where the community was very concerned about it. And I, I listened to them and felt that I'd built a relationship with Greyhound where I could make that request. And they, they came back almost immediately with a positive response saying that they would stop Greyhound uh, um, routes into Scranton for the well, really until further notice. So that was a positive thing. I really, again, you're trying to listen to your community, but also balance your balance what you can do in your role and, and try to figure that out. So that's been, a, that was an interesting case. Um, I'm 
so thankful for Greyhound and I'm also thankful for my community for, for pointing out something that really mattered to them. Now, how are you making sure that you're communicating with, with the citizens of Scranton and making Mm -hmm. sure that they're getting the information that you think they should be getting? Yeah, so we do regular town halls. We do 12 p.m. Thursdays and Fridays. Those are on Facebook Live, and there's a dial-in number. We take um, questions through our mayor's office number, our 311 email, um, and on Facebook. We compile those questions, and I answer those questions twice a week. It's been a really good mechanism to answer questions as as these situations developed. So that's been one way. Um, we have a, a COVID guidebook in both English and Spanish that you can access on Facebook on our website, or actually we've got paper copies outside of City Hall in case people want to go pick those up in person. So we're trying to get the information out that way. What's really cool about Scranton is we're we're, we're big in some ways, but we're really small in other ways. And I think one way we're, we're a small city is we really communicate well and within each, within our communities, within our social service networks, within our business networks and our, our social uh, circles. So I, I think that's been a positive thing. We've been able to get the news out and we're, we're really fortunate to still have a robust uh, newspaper here in Scranton. Now you talked about how Scranton was a tight knit community. It's very close. How has that helped with fighting COVID-19? Yeah, like I said, I think that initial message as we started to get the information that you could be a silent carrier of COVID, I, I remember saying that the, the first press conference we did, it's not about how you feel, it's about the fact that you could take this home to your grandfather at Sunday night dinner. And that, that maybe wouldn't resonate in every, in every area, but I, it really does resonate here because you still have a lot of people who do Sunday night dinners with their grandparents or their parents. Um, or, you know, friends and family get together a lot. And those, anybody who's immunocompromised, for example, um, that really resonated in that way. Um, So I am encouraged and hopeful that 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 tight-knit community, that tight-knit nature of Scranton is helping us fight this. Now, how are you supporting the citizens of Scranton to make sure that, you know, they're all staying as safe and healthy as possible during this really hard time? So we continue to pump out the information for social services, you know, dial 211. And we have, I have these really detailed um, info sessions at the beginning of my town halls, um, giving the phone numbers for either how to volunteer, you know, give the Red Cross phone number, or on the other side, dial 211, or go to, you know, the, the, the soup kitchen at this time for this, this food drive. So we've really tried to be detailed about where and when you can go get services. I try, I keep emphasizing that there's no shame in reaching out. This is such a, a curveball thrown at every single family. There's no shame in going and getting a basket of food. There's no shame in applying for unemployment. It's really trying to take the stigma away and trying to keep keep that message because I think, I mean, I know from experience, even in my own household, you know, my husband's a business owner and, you know, we have had some really, really tough conversations and be in this crisis. So, you know, know that you're not alone out there. That's been one of our messages. And we keep um, giving the mental health um, different text and phone call phone numbers because we want to make sure people understand that it's also it's also good and, and encouraged to raise your hand if you're having um, anxiety or mental health issues around this. Now, as a final question, you've also encouraged citizens to gather virtually. Why is that so important, especially during a hard time like this? Well, I think that it cues off of that mental health piece, right, is that we all, I mean, I've been having terrible dreams. For example, I just, I wake up and this is a really, it's a hard time. And so you need to keep those social links strong. You need to be with your family or not be with, you can't be with your family. You got to talk to them. You need to call those, those neighbors or those, those people that, you know, might be living alone or, or might be feeling lonely. You've got to be keeping those, those social ties strong and try to talk about something that's not COVID related. I've also been trying to emphasize, you know, don't watch the news 24 hours a day. You don't have to read every article. You know, you just drive yourself crazy. So have a, have a coffee chat with your girlfriends. You know, my mom did one last night. I did one Sunday night with some of my girlfriends, you know, and talk about, like, do not talk about COVID. Try to make sure that you guys are just keeping it, keeping it business as usual as much as you can socially some night so that we don't, you know, go down some of those spirals and, and feel, feel, feel despair because there, this is going to end. We are going to get through it. And it's really important that we keep our mental health. Paige Cognetti, Mayor of Scranton, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. Stay home and stay safe. (laughs) Tired of unbalanced views and networks pushing their own angles? PCN brings it to you straight. We don't edit what was said to fit a point of view. We bring you the entire event. No slant, no editing, the whole story. A complete view without the angle. 
Watch PCN on cable and on the PCN app. Stream politics and policy on your favorite device for free. I'm joined by the general manager of the Reading Fighting, Phil Scott Hunsinger. He's in his 29th year with the organization. He's been the general manager since 2007. And Thursday, August the 9th, Scott, would be a day of a pure adrenaline rush for you by yeah. most normal means. And now all of a sudden you're stuck like everybody else, unfortunately, in an idle position. This is going <laughs> to be a real culture shock for you right now. Yeah, you know, certainly uh... – for most of my staff has been been what the art feels for many 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 years and so like it's almost like culturally this is our life you know six months of all season six months of season then six months of all season then six months of season so you know right about the time you would start to get bored with the off season you have the season uh, which is why most of us are in this industry is the season you know uh so yeah, it's mentally and emotionally you know, for everybody right now. But yeah, certainly for us, the adrenaline rush of having a full stadium on opening night and and all that comes along with that uh, is why we're all in this business. Uh, so yeah, so you know, opening day is a, is it's a tough one, and yeah, no question. Reading has been one of the most successful franchises, really, in all of minor league baseball. You traditionally get yourself in and around and over four hundred thousand people through the turnstiles on a on a regular basis. So I, I guess we got to start with the most obvious question. You're, you've been in this game for a long time. What's your gut instinct on, on, on the likelihood of having a season at all? You know, I don't really have any more insight, honestly, than you or any of your viewers have. <laughs> I mean, honestly. Um, and, I, and I don't know I don't know that anybody does. I don't know that the commissioner of Major League Baseball would be able to answer the question any better than, than me or you. Right. Um, you know, certainly our sense is that we're not near having a game with 7,000 people in the stadium. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, to, in full transparency, what we're telling our partners, our, our stakeholders, our ticket holders is, you know, hey, we may not have a game, you know. And so uh, we hope, man, we all hope for right. uh, a lot of reasons way bigger <laughs> than just having a game. You know, if we have a game, that means that there's been a lot of good news. Right, uh, so we're hopeful. Recently. We're very hopeful that we'll have a game because obviously the bigger picture, that would mean there were a lot of good things that had occurred before that day. Um, but we're also realistic. Um, we may not have a game. So I, I, I have no insight or guess. Uh, we've prepared mentally to not have a game. Uh, and we'll certainly uh, be very, very happy if we do have one. This may be a bad question, but I, I, I just want it just sticks in my mind. Is there a date of a point of no return? Like if we don't get it by this date, we're, we're, we're done. We can't possibly make anything happen out of this. Similar answer. I don't know. <laughs> there were like so many of my answers right now. No, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there is. I'm sure that somebody, uh, you know, much, much higher up than Scott Hunsaker is probably running those models, but, right. uh, you know, it does us really not much good to the, Try to figure that out. Right. Uh, same as it wouldn't do me much good if, you know, some have asked, well, imagine the season starts July 1st. You know, what would you do with the schedule? It's like, right. well, tell me there's going to be a game on July 1st and we'll figure <laughs> out what to do with the schedule. You know, I, I, honestly, right. so not to make light of it. But, uh, yeah, at some point, Bob, I'm sure there is a point in no return. You know, right now our attention uh, obviously is supporting the community in any way we can. Uh, and quite frankly, you know, the 23 full-time people that work at the R Phils, you know, our, us, our families, uh, most, if not all of us have been with Craig Stein and, and, and the R Phils for essentially our entire adult life. So, uh, you know, as the general manager of that team of, of those front office people, you know, that's, that's really my main focus is, you know, how, how do I get those 23 people through this period of time, whatever this period of time is, you know, how do I protect them and their families and, and their career and, you know, and all of those things. And then obviously through those people, our team worries about our entire fan base, our corporate partners, people like you that are a part of our family, uh, you know, and so you know, that's really what we're concentrating on. Yeah. It's, it's just such a different dichotomy because anybody has been in what everybody in Berks County calls baseball town and they know Scott Hunsinger, they know he's the guy in the lion shirt who's usually out on the field being an MC or being the proverbial game show host in the stands, interacting with the fans. But right now, you really are the business person that is Scott Hunsinger that's usually behind the scenes. 
Yeah, I know. I'm like playing like a regular guy job right now. I don't like it so much. You know, I, a lot of time on the phone with bankers and uh, people like that. And I have, I have a lot of friends that are bankers, but I'm glad, you know, I don't go to work there every day as well. I understand. Saying, but uh, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I like mascots and French fries. You know what I mean? And uh, I sit around for hours and figure it out. <laughs> mascots and French fries is what we always joke about and game day promotions and, uh, you know, I was a social director of my fraternity at Albright, and, you know, I like throwing parties, and I like going to parties, and uh, and so do most of the people that come to our games. That's, That's exactly true. So, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, it's tough everywhere, man. It's tough. It's tough for everywhere, I man. At least we still, at the end of the day, we still get to talk about baseball and a ballpark, and, uh, you know, we've been, put, been able to put some fun things out on social media, uh, and certainly, um, you know, my heart goes out to the first responders and quite quite frankly those those healthcare workers and their families um, you know so my family has me here every day if I was a doctor in a, in a hospital we'd be in a different situation so you know at, at some point my role as a party thrower you know <laughs> will, will hopefully hopefully be valuable you know honestly and, and our front office and our ability to have a a community come together and, and help them through the whole healing process. And, and even if that's just forgetting it, having fun, you know, at some point in time, uh, hopefully we'll get to concentrate that, on that again right now that it almost seems like so de minimis uh, that it's almost weird to talk about, to be honest with you, because there's people that are, that are way more essential to what's going on right now than, than me. Uh, and, and certainly uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different feeling. Yeah, it really, it really does put everything in perspective, and it's a great point by you. And and in addition to putting seventy plus baseball games on the field every year, the the Reading Fighting Phils are also a great partner in the community in, in Reading and Berks County, and even beyond the borders of Berks County. But it's also something you also do other things at the stadium, and you have had other things at the stadium behind besides baseball. So yeah. as you start to look beyond the future and when life gets back to being normal again, I would venture to bet that there's probably some wheels turning with you and your staff of what other kinds of things we could do at the stadium to bring everybody back together again. Certainly. You know, uh, look, you know, uh, the people that work with the art fills are, we're creative entrepreneurial people <laughs> who like to figure things like that out. Uh, there's a part of the brain that has to be exercised. <laughs> um, and, and, and quite frankly, that part of the brain is entrepreneurial, uh, thought provoking, profit generating, nonprofit generating, community minded. Uh, so we do spend a part of every day working on that. Uh, the tough part about that is when's that going to be, right. you know, so, you know, we had, uh, we probably had more high school games scheduled this year at our stadium than ever. Um, we, we host things like, you know, junior league of Reading touch a truck or kids crawl on trucks. And we host, you know, events with the humane society and we have people that want to have weddings. Uh, we just got a call about a wedding this weekend, actually. So not that they wanted to have it this weekend, but they want to plan it. Um, you know, Hey, when, when, when can you though? That's the toughest part, honestly. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to keep talking about those things, but we don't know when we'll be able to do them, but, uh, when we're able to do them. We'll do them well. That's really been our, our, our whole goal here, honestly, is to just be good partners to everybody. And, you know, this is a tough time. There's a lot of our corporate partners that uh, this is a tough time for them. Um, is there any way we can help them? Is there any way we can be part of the solution? And, and we're also going to be the easiest person to deal with through this, whether that's with a season ticket holder, a corporate partner. Uh, we haven't been invoicing anybody. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna work with them if they need their money back. We're gonna give it back to them. You know, we're gonna be that partner, and we're gonna try to turn you know lemons into lemonade through this to the best of our ability by just playing the long game uh, with our fans, with our corporate partners, with everybody, uh, and just say, hey, we're all in this together. Let's figure it out, and uh, let's be as flexible as possible. Yeah, the one last thing I want to talk to you about, and that is the stadium. The, the, what was once Municipal Stadium and is now First Energy Stadium and is referred to as America's ballpark uh, by, by you and the organization for, for a very worthwhile reason. It's, a, it's an old ballpark that has been remodeled and remodeled and remodeled. The Reading Phillies and the Philadelphia Phillies, the organization together, 
is since 1967. That's the longest affiliation in all of yep. minor league baseball, which is obviously a tribute to you and Craig Stein and everybody with the organization that the Phillies have kept you as part of their family for as long as they have. But this mm-hmm. is also a milestone season for what was, again, Municipal Stadium, now First Energy Stadium, that was built in 1951. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the, the, the cornerstone, I guess you call it, says 1950, uh, right in the front of this ballpark. Right. And this is 2020, so 70, simple math. Uh, right. But whether that happens in 2020 or whether it happens in 2021, we'll still celebrate. It's the 70th <laughs> so, season. <laughs> it's a good reason to have a party. Uh, you know, Moore was coming in this year. Carlos Ruiz is coming in this year. You know, we had some really awesome uh, some awesome stuff, and, and we'll have it. You know, right. if we have it in July or August, we'll have it in July or August. <laughs> if we have it in 2021, we'll have it in 2021. Uh, you know, it's funny. We, we joke about it all the time, but – you know, people were like, when are you going to bring Ryan Howard? When are you going to bring Ryan Howard? It's like, well, you know what? We'll bring in Jimmy Riles. We'll bring in Ryan Howard. We'll bring in Carlos Ruiz. Uh, if Carlos Ruiz comes this May, which he's probably not, <laughs> then we'll have Carlos Ruiz this August or we'll have him next April. So, yeah, this was a big year for us. But you know what? We've been here a long time. We're not going anywhere. Uh, we're all in this together. Let's sit it out. And eventually we'll have a game at America's Classic Ballpark again. Yeah, that's really uh, that's the only way we can approach it. Yeah, it's going to be, it's a hurry up and wait, Scott, but it's certainly, uh, we know it's what, what happens in Reading and with the, with the Reading fight fills, it's worth waiting for. So oh, I'm sorry you, that you have to have time on your hands, but thanks for taking some time with us. <laughs> and I hope baseball comes back real soon. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate you having me. And uh, for our first responders and our healthcare workers, thank you so much. Very well put. Scott Hunsinger, the general manager of the Reading fight and fills.